The Apostle John walked closely with Jesus during all of his earthly ministry. He was used of God to give us a remarkable, intimate, powerful account of the ministry of Jesus. And now, as the cross draws near, Jesus' last night becomes the darkest night in mankind's history. There, in the shadows with Jesus, the swelling darkness makes every effort to overtake our Savior. The coming scenes of suffering are the backdrop for this night as Jesus prepares to face the hardest day of his project of salvation for the guilty through the substitution of the innocent. John composed his gospel to provide reasons of saving faith, proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and offers the gift of salvation. He declares, these things are written that you may believe. Let's turn in our Bibles together to John 19 as we continue in our study of the book of John this morning. We will begin in verse 31. Again, that's John 19, verse 31. The author C.S. Lewis outlived his late wife, Joy, by only three years. She died of cancer in July of 1960. And that next year, Lewis published a book called A Grief Observed. And in that book, he brutally shares his experience in the wake of his wife's death as they had only been married for three years when Joy passed away. So Lewis wrestles with the pain of that loss and he deals honestly with his anger at God for taking her. But what I love about the book is that ultimately, Lewis's conclusion is one of thanks and gratefulness to God for the brief time that the Lord gave him with his bride. In the book, Lewis writes this. He says, you never know how much you really believe anything until it's truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. I'm gonna read that again. You never know how much you really believe anything until it's truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. Lewis can say that about the death of his wife, but essentially our passage this morning says that about the death of Jesus. Truly believing that Jesus was crucified and died and was buried is a matter of life and death. It's a matter of eternal life and death. So having spent last Sunday studying the final moments on the cross, we ended with the Lord Jesus saying, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. One would think that the story was over at that point. And to a lot of people then, and even now today, they believe the story was over at that point. In fact, I remember as a kid watching the TV movie musical, Jesus Christ Superstar. And that movie ends with the crucifixion. Jesus is executed and all the hippies just kind of get on the bus and go home. I think I was probably about eight years old and even I knew then that more was to come. And thank, thankfully there is. So as we finish out the book of John over the next couple of Sundays, let's remember that believing in the details of the verses that we will be studying is a matter of life and death. So let's stand this morning together in honor of the reading of God's word as we look at John 19, beginning in verse 31. The word of God says this. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. 
But these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now this first portion of our passage today is the event of the piercing of Jesus. Number one on your outline is the piercing of Jesus. And it's important to note that inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, John wrote his account of Jesus' ministry about 60 years after the crucifixion. And already by that time, there were false teachers who were advocating different lies about Jesus' death. The first lie was that Jesus didn't really die, that instead he merely passed out on the cross or experienced a coma and somehow was revived from that when he was laid in the tomb. That was one lie propagated by the skeptics in John's day, but there was another lie as well. And that lie was that Jesus didn't really have a human body. This group of skeptics denied the incarnation. So if he didn't have a real physical body when he was born in Bethlehem, he didn't have a physical body when he was crucified on the cross. But by John's own testimony of what he saw, he explains firsthand how the piercing of Jesus debunks all of that. And we'll get to that shortly. But before we do, there are some things that lead up to that moment of piercing. And that is letter A on your outline, the concern. There was a concern. And this is one of the first things that we see in our passage this morning. Verse 31, look at it in your Bible. It calls this the day of preparation. So it was late Friday afternoon by this point. So that meant that preparations were being made not only for the weekly Sabbath, but this particular Friday was also during Passover. That's why this verse mentions it as a high day. It's a particularly important Sabbath day because of the Passover. So it's sort of a double whammy in terms of significance. And as a result, the Jewish leaders express their concern about the timing of all of this. And they want the bodies off the crosses before sundown. But in order to do that, all three of the men being crucified needed to be dead, right? See, the whole point of Roman execution was to publicly intimidate everybody watching. And that's only effective if the people actually die on those crosses. And so breaking the criminal's legs would expedite the process of death. They would die quicker because they would no longer be able to use their legs to push up and catch a breath. See, this position hanging on a cross is designed to suffocate. And if I can use my legs to push up and catch a breath, I can extend my life. But if my legs are broken, I can't push up to take a breath and I would die faster. This would allow the bodies to be removed before sundown. See, in the Old Testament law, specifically in Deuteronomy chapter one, there's a prohibition not to leave an executed body out overnight because that exposure would defile the land, not to mention the Sabbath and the Passover. So the Jewish leaders were essentially straining at gnats and swallowing camels right here. That's what they were doing. R.C. Sproul says that their concern here is a, quote, revealing example of the Jewish leader's depraved insensitivity that they join forces to commit murder and at the same time are so careful about enforcing 
the ceremonial law. See, these religious leaders were completely blind to their own sin. And you know what? We can fall prey to that same thing today. That's why we need each other. That's why a husband needs a wife. That's why a wife needs her husband. That's why families need each other. That's why this local church, we need each other. That's why church membership is so important because I'm accountable to you and you're accountable to me. You help me with my blind spots and I help you with yours. Friends, our church covenant states that we are to listen to each other in a way that is slow to take offense, open to correction, and ready for reconciliation. So let me ask you a question. How'd you do with that last week? Is that your posture with the people that love you? See, the Jewish leaders had a concern, but that concern was simply a cover for their sin, to which they were blind to. Now, not only do we see the concern here, but we also see the caution. Let her be on your outline, is the caution. Look at verse 33 in your Bibles with me. Verse 33 says that when they got to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. They did not break his legs. There's the caution. See, there was no need to expedite the death of Jesus because they didn't take his life. He had already given it. Jesus had already made it super clear to the disciples way back in John chapter 10 that he is the one who gives of his own life. In verses 17 and 18 of John 10, Jesus said this, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. Does Jesus sound like a victim to you? No, he's not a victim. He's a willing volunteer, submissive to his father's will to serve as one who gives his life as a ransom for sinners like you and me. He gave his life in the father's timing, not in anyone else's timing, and that included the Jewish leaders. They didn't break his legs because he'd already given his life willingly. And verse 34 continues, look at it with me. It says, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. Now there are several different possible medical reasons for this, but diving into those reasons is not really the point. The point of this description here is that the human body does not do this unless it's dead. Jesus was clearly dead. And by the way, while Jesus was dead, he did not go to hell. That's not biblical. And I'll explain how we know that was not the case on the Beyond the Notes podcast this coming Tuesday. But John's point here is that Jesus gave his own life and when he gave it, he really died. It's not a coma. He didn't just pass out. His very real human body produces proof that he is truly dead. And why does that matter? That's letter C on your outline, the cooperation. The cooperation. Lawyers love cooperating evidence. And lawyers love cooperating witnesses. Why? Because cooperating evidence is evidence that confirms already existing evidence. And a cooperating witness is one whose testimony confirms a testimony that's already been given. So cooperation sort of locks down the case. And that's what John is doing here in verse 35. Look at it with me. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows he is telling the truth. Now we've seen this interesting way in which John refers to himself without actually referring to himself. We've seen that before. When, when he says he who saw it, John's talking about himself. He's talking about what he saw. But what is he corroborating? Whose testimony is John confirming? Jesus' testimony. Don't forget, John was a disciple and Jesus had been telling the disciples all along that he was going to die in this manner. So John's own truthful eyewitness testimony is further proof of Jesus' actual death. He was there at the foot of the cross as we saw last Sunday. 
And he says to anybody who reads this account, what happened is what Jesus said would happen and I saw it happen. And just so we won't miss it, John reminds us of the point of his testimony at the end of verse 35. He tells us at the end, he says, that also you may believe. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, he's been saying that all throughout this entire account. John is inviting us to join him in believing in Jesus' death. Friends, I'll say it again. This is a matter of life and death, an eternal life and death. Every single person, because of our sin, deserves death and the judgment of hell forever. But God has provided a singular way to escape his just judgment against you and I. And that escape vessel is, it's not a boat as it was in Noah's day, but that vessel is a person, Jesus Christ, God's one and only son. And through his death, Jesus bore the wrath of God for sin of people like you and me. That, that sacrificial and substitutionary death is the only means by which we can be saved. It's the only means by which we can turn from our sin and trust in Christ alone to save us. Will you trust him today? If you're outside of Christ this morning, will you turn from your sin and turn to your savior? Friend, it's a matter of eternal life and eternal death. So far in the piercing of Jesus, we've seen the concern, the caution, the cooperation, and finally, we see the credentials. Letter D on your outline is the credentials. Now in 2018, Andy Stanley, a pastor in Georgia, made the statement in a sermon to his church that the Christian faith must, must unhitch from the Old Testament. That was his term, unhitch. Because evidently the Old Testament is irrelevant and not applicable, I guess. And he's tried to walk that statement back a couple of times, but it's clear to me anyway that at the very least, he has a dismissiveness of the Old Testament. And guess what, friends? He's not alone. Many professing Christians today view the Old Testament as irrelevant or unnecessary. So why shouldn't we unhitch from it? Well, there's a reason why. Friends, the Bible is one book. It's one narrative whose parts cannot be unhitched from each other. And the Old Testament itself serves as credentials that point forward to Jesus Christ, who in the Old Testament was the promised Messiah to come. And in verse 36, I love what John does here. He emphasizes the essential necessity of the Old Testament when he says, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. And he gives two Old Testament references. Let's take those one at a time. Look at them with me. The end of verse 36, he says, none of his bones will be broken. Now, John's account in verse 33 that we just looked at affirms that this was true of Jesus. His bones were not broken. And John is quoting here from the Old Testament book of Exodus. Brothers and sisters, it's no coincidence that the instructions for the Passover lamb written in Exodus 12, almost 1,500 years before the crucifixion, those instructions clearly state that the animal's bones are not to be broken in preparation of the Passover meal. A meal, mind you, that Jesus had just observed with his disciples the night before this particular night in John 19. Jesus is the true Passover lamb. And as the true Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus' bones are not broken either. Hmm, so what is the Old Testament doing? It's showing us Jesus' credentials as Messiah. John also goes on to quote Zechariah 12, 10. They look on him whom they have pierced. And this comes from um, Zechariah's prophecy in the Old Testament, which was almost 600 years before the crucifixion. The living God is speaking through the prophet Zechariah. And he says this, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. See, in Zechariah's original prophecy, the piercing that, the, that God is speaking of is his own heart. The Lord is pierced to the heart by his people's unfaithfulness in Zechariah's day. And the Holy Spirit, hundreds of years later, would inspire the apostle John to apply not just the metaphorical piercing, but the literal piercing in the death of God's one and only son. And that death is proven as a Roman guard pierces Jesus with a spear. Here again, the Old Testament serves as credentials pointing forward to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So we have the piercing of Jesus, but the second half of our passage primarily focuses on the burial of Jesus. Number two on your outline is the burial of Jesus. And while the Jewish leaders wanted the bodies off the crosses as quick as possible, the Romans would have been content to leave the bodies up there for days or even weeks. Bodies were usually left to be eaten by birds of prey or other scavenging animals that would come around. So the burial of Jesus was not really a foregone conclusion. And that's important as we look at the second part of this passage. Now y'all can check me on this, but I think the most recent US president to pass away was George H.W. Bush in December of 2018. And I think we can all agree that a presidential funeral has to be well planned out. In the case of President Bush Sr., a period of national mourning took place for a month. And his three funerals took place over four days. First, his body lies in state in the Capitol. And then there's a funeral in Washington, D.C. And then a funeral in Houston, Texas. And then eventually where his body was laid in College Station, Texas. Now, all those funerals had pallbearers and, and motorcades and military salutes and heads of state, on and on and on. See, most countries go to great lengths to be prepared to pull off an honorable and dignified burial of a leader who passes away. And even though all the events of Jesus' death to this point make it seem like that ain't gonna happen, the God who is sovereign over every minute of every day ensures that a proper burial is given to the King of Kings. And two disciples are mentioned here who step up to be a part of that proper burial. Letter A on your outline is prepared people. These were prepared people that God used. Now I realize that more than two people were prepared to honor Jesus in his burial and we'll look at those other folks next Sunday. But here at the end of John 19, John mentions only two, both men who made preparations before the sun went down Friday evening. And the first of those is Joseph of Arimathea. Look at verse 38. Look at what it says about Joseph. It says that he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. So John tells us that Joseph was someone who followed Christ. And, and Joseph is actually mentioned in the burial accounts of all four of the gospels. Matthew tells us he was rich. Mark tells us he was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. Luke tells us that Joseph was a righteous man who disagreed with the Jewish leadership decision to put Jesus to death. And here John mentions that even though he was a disciple, he was a secret disciple that feared the Jewish leaders. Now you can look at that as a negative thing, but I believe John includes it here to show a contrast to what Joseph does do in this moment. And what does he do in this moment? Well, at a time when most of the disciples are hiding in fear for their life, Joseph goes to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus in order to give him a proper burial. Now, I don't know about you, but that's gutsy in my view. You think about the charge that Jesus was executed for, sedition, treason. And if you're the Roman governor of Judea 
you're not gonna be easy come, easy go about the body of somebody you just executed for treason. So Joseph risked his life to advocate for a proper burial for his Lord. And he did it before the highest Roman official in that region. Brothers and sisters, that's courage in the public square right there. And courage comes by trusting in the one who holds all the keys, the one who has the highest authority, and that's Jesus. Joseph trusted Jesus. And what is needed in our church, what is needed in your family and my family, in your workplace and my workplace, what is needed in this country are growing disciples of Jesus who have the courage to risk everything for their king. But Joseph did what was right because he believed Jesus was worth it. And verse 38 says, Pilate gave him permission. So he took the body. May God help us in the time in which we live to be people of courage who are willing to risk everything for our king. Joseph was one such man. But Joseph was not alone in terms of him being prepared. So was Nicodemus. Number two on your outline is Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is mentioned in verse 39, look at it with me, as one who earlier had come to Jesus by night. I just love that reminder. If you remember John chapter three, it captures the whole conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus about what it means to be born again. And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night at that time, probably because he was afraid of being seen with Jesus. Again, Nicodemus was also a member of the Sanhedrin. Think of the Sanhedrin as the the Jewish Supreme Court. It's the highest judicial body in all of ancient Israel. And both of these men were a part of that group. And with all the doubts and all the questions that Nicodemus had way back in John chapter three, look at what the Lord has done in his life now. He's come out of the dark. He's come into the light. And like Joseph, Nicodemus has also grown and matured in his faith. Brothers and sisters, that's what it's all about. Regardless of how long you've walked with Jesus, or how long you've been around McGregor, if you're not growing spiritually, check yourself. 2 Corinthians 13, five says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Probably just a few years ago in both of these men's lives, people might've wondered if they really followed Christ or not, but it's clear now that they do. And whereas Joseph risked his life to honor Christ, Nicodemus risked his wealth to honor Christ and provide him a proper burial. Nicodemus exhibits that joyful generosity that we talk about all the time around here. Just look at what he brought in verse 39, second half of verse 39, look at it with me. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. Now that's a lot of spices for one person. But that's how extravagant Nicodemus was in his sacrifice for Christ. Why? Why was he so extravagant? Well, Jesus had changed his life. And when Jesus changes your life, no cost is too high. No gift is too great. See, deep down in the heart of every single one of us lies the question, is Jesus really worth it to me? For Nicodemus, that answer was yes, absolutely. That was his default position. And friends, in the culture in which we live today, where the persecution of God's people is increasing, that question could not be more relevant to you and I than it is right now. Is Jesus really worth it to you? So in history's darkest moment, God used two prepared people to lavish the honor that was due our savior and king. And it was at great risk. But these two disciples were a part of the provision that God made for Jesus to have a proper burial. And that proper burial ended up being in a providential place. 
Last on your outline, letter B, is a providential place. I want you to look at verse 41 with me. It says, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a what? Say it again with me, a what? A garden, that's right. And in the garden, a new tomb, which no one had yet been laid. This verse also speaks to the wealth and the influence of Joseph of Arimathea, because this was a rock tomb for Joseph that was cut out of the mountain. And that was only possible for very wealthy people. And even though verse 42 seems to indicate that this choice of tombs was made out of convenience because, well, it was close and time was of the essence, God was also at work in that as well. Verse 42 is just one more reminder of God's providence in all of this. This tomb was a providential place. Some of you might be asking, okay, well, what is God's providence? Well, the simple definition of God's providence is that God's providence is his continued work, sustaining all of his creation every minute of every day. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says this of Jesus Christ, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. That last little phrase right there perfectly captures the doctrine of God's providence. In him, all things hold together. You see, we serve the living God of the Bible who not only created everything in the universe, but moment by moment, he sustains it and he holds it all together. He does that on a nanoscopic level as well as a cosmological level. Everything is contingent upon God, friends. Nothing exists apart from God. So nothing happens by chance and there are no coincidences. Not even a tomb in a nearby garden that allowed Joseph and Nicodemus to give Jesus a proper burial quickly. And the fact that John notes that this never before used tomb is a private garden, that's an essential detail not to be missed either. Rewind the clock back 12 hours. Where was Jesus? In a garden. The Garden of Gethsemane is a different garden. But what was he doing in that garden? He was proclaiming his trust in the Father's will for his life, which was to die on a cross. And he submitted to that will. Father, not my will, but yours be done. That crucial moment in the unfolding plan of God's redemption, that happened in a garden as well. But don't stop at Gethsemane. <laughs> There's another garden that is connected to this burial garden in John 19, and that's the Garden of Eden. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter three. And in that garden, sin came into the world through our first parents, Adam and Eve. And their disobedience, their sin originally took place in that garden. And so the Garden of Eden necessitated the garden in John 19. And Gethsemane prompted the garden in John 19. But you know the unique thing about the garden in John 19? is that that garden declares that sin was defeated once and for all by Christ. When our sin was born in the Garden of Eden, it, was, it brought death to all men. But in this garden in John 19, Jesus conquers death. And we'll see how, how that plays out next Sunday. Friends, death comes to us all. It's one of the stark realities of life that ironically, the majority of people on this planet try to ignore, but we can't. Death always catches up to every single one of us eventually. It should not be ignored. And brothers and sisters, the death of Jesus will not be ignored. His piercing shows us the true reality of his death, that it really happened. While his burial shows us the cause of his death. And that was our sin. Having come to suffer and die to redeem sinners from the wrath of a holy God, Jesus was pierced and he was buried. And believing in that or not believing in that is a matter of eternal life 
and eternal death.